All right, you guys. In the previous video, what we did was we found the center and radius of a sphere um, given any four points in 3D space that were not coplanar that we said must belong to the surface of that sphere. And in doing so, what we had to do is we had to utilize um, Newton's method for, you know, multivariable vector valued functions. And so um, that whole thing then was this, where those x symbols represent vectors, right? This is, of course, is a vector valued function, so that was a vector as well. And then this is the inverse Jacobian matrix. And so if you haven't seen that video, you absolutely need to go back and see that video. But um, in the first part of the video, you know, we spent 10 minutes coming up with a certain system of equations. And then we said, well, um, we've set up my system of equations so that ideally each of those equations was just equal to zero on one side. And that's great because the whole idea of Newton's method is that it's for finding zeros of a function. So Newton's method really only works in those situations where you're trying to find the zeros of a function f. But also in a previous video that I hope you've seen, um, we could also use Newton's method for finding the critical points of a function f. But remember that finding critical points of a function f would be the same as finding the zeros of the derivative, right? The zeros of the derivative function, these are just critical points of f. So in, you know, multivariable functions, what does that look like? What kind of formula are we going to come up with? Well, um, it's going to be something like this. I have my solution vector x, iterate n minus, n plus 1 equals x iterate n minus, and then, um, gosh, this might look a little bit silly to you guys right now, but I promise I'll try my best to explain everything in this video. Um, this is called the inverse, of course, because you see the negative one up there, but this is the inverse Hessian matrix. And then, of course, you've seen that symbol before. You've seen the NABLA triangle, and so that tells me that this is the gradient. F. So in other words, since I'm talking about f being a multivariable function, and I want to find the critical points of a multivariable function, um, normally the critical points are zeros of the first derivative, right? But there would be more than one first partial derivative of a multivariable function, and so this Newton's method is for finding the zeros of the gradient of f. Okay, so now you're already familiar with everything we're doing. You know how to find the gradient of f. Um, you might also be concerned about what is a Hessian matrix, and that would be a very you know normal question to ask at this point. But um, let's go ahead and sort of give an example, but I'm going to keep everything relatively abstract in this video. I'm not actually going to work a concrete example in this video. Instead, what if I have a multivariable but single valued function f? So that means, like, uh, as an input to the function, Let's say that f has three input variables, but it could have more. Um, you know, you could have as many input variables as you like. Uh, 
f is going to map those three input variables just to one single output variable. Let's just, in fact, let's call it f. Or, or I, yeah, I guess that's the best way to do it. We'll just call this f, right? So there's only one output. This is a, a scalar output, is what I'm trying to say. In other words, you could say that f describes a scalar field, I guess in 3D space, if you wanted to say that. Um, that's the kind of function that we're talking about here. So that means the gradient of f would be, you know, the vector with three entries. I'm going to have the partial of f with respect to x, the partial of f with respect to y, and the partial of f with respect to z, right? The partial derivative of my scalar valued function with respect to each of the input variables. Okay? So that's the gradient. Then what would be the Hessian matrix? What's, what do I mean by capital H? In this case, the Hessian matrix would be the matrix where I have um, <clears throat> the derivative of f with respect to x sorry let me say that that's the second partial derivative of f with respect to x and then i would have sort of a mixed partial derivative with respect to x and y and then i would have a mixed partial derivative with respect to x and z and then I would have a mixed partial derivative um, with respect to y and x, and a mixed partial derivative with respect to y and y. Never mind, that's not a mixed partial. That's just the second partial derivative with respect to y. And then a mixed partial derivative with respect to y and z. And then we would have a mixed partial derivative with respect to z and x, a mixed partial derivative with respect to z and y, and then the second partial derivative of f with respect to z. So the pure second partial derivatives are on the diagonal of this matrix, and the mixed partials lie above and below the diagonal. But since we know that the partial derivative of f with respect to x and y is in almost all cases that we're concerned about, right, for every analytic function f, which is most of the functions we deal with in calculus 3, um, most of the time what we care about is this. We, most of the time we care about functions where this uh, derivative with respect to x and y is the same thing as the partial derivative with respect to y and then x. So We've already talked about this in a previous video, but sort of the path you take to finding the Smith's partial doesn't matter because these should be equivalent um, if f is a nice function. And I'll tell you that, you know, in this class we almost always deal with nice functions. I hesitate to say always, but I'm pretty sure it's always. So I should say that in our Calculus 3 class, um, uh, f is a nice function. And I could, could be more specific. Instead of saying nice, I could say um, analytic function of x, y, and z. Right? OK. And that means, since you know these mixed partials are uh, equivalent to each other, this Hessian matrix should be symmetric. And what do I mean by a symmetric matrix? Because that might be the first time you've heard a matrix described as being symmetric. What I mean is that if I have this matrix, um, one possibility could be that it is 4, 5, 6. And the idea of being symmetric is if I have a 0 here, then I have to have a 0 there. If I have a 7 over here, then I have to have a 7 over there. And if I have a 1 here, that means I have to have a 1 there. It's symmetric across the diagonal, 
So whenever I talk about a symmetric matrix, or you ever hear about a symmetric matrix, it means it's symmetric across a diagonal. And the Hessian matrix is symmetric for nice functions. Okay. So that's fine. Um, that's what the Hessian matrix means. It's this matrix of partial derivatives. And of course, I'm taking the inverse Hessian matrix, so don't forget about that inverse there, in this whole deal, uh, in this whole Newton's method formula, right, for finding the critical points of a multivariable function. We've talked about um, how these x symbols right here represent a vector. In fact, just to make this more clear, it might be smart to not use uh, the symbol x, because I've already used the symbol x in other places. Maybe it would be more clear for me to use the symbol u. So u just represents your solution vector. It represents the vector that contains all of your input variables, x, y, and z. Of course, I've just defined for you, again, the gradient, what that looks like. And I've defined for you the Hessian matrix. You know how to take an inverse. One more thing I guess I could say is um, I could once again define v to be my step change vector. So you'll remember this from a previous video. I say v is my step change vector if v is equal to the inverse Hessian times the gradient of f. And that means I could rewrite this Newton's method formula as un plus 1 is equal to un minus v, right? And to solve this little equation, I can left multiply both sides of the equation by my Hessian matrix. Um, now it ends up with something like this. And of course, the Hessian matrix times the inverse Hessian matrix just gives me the identity matrix. And the identity matrix times a vector is just going to be a vector itself. So you can solve this. You can solve for the step change vector one of two ways. You could either take the inverse of the Hessian matrix and then do matrix vector multiplication between that inverse Hessian matrix and the gradient vector to find your step change vector. Or alternatively, you could solve this matrix vector equation. Since we know the Hessian matrix and we know the gradient, we can solve for V using Gaussian elimination. And again, in the previous video, I showed you that in the, uh, in the Python library NumPy, there is a command for solving matrix vector equations using Gaussian elimination. And so that's actually kind of convenient. And it technically speeds up your program a little bit and technically reduces round off error. So that's generally the smart way to do things um, if you were going to do this kind of professionally as a computational mathematician. Um, anyways, I'm not going to work a concrete example, but I've laid the roadmap for you to do everything, you know, in the abstract sense. In your project, this is going to be kind of the idea. In your project, I'm going to give you a multivariable function that maps many, many input variables, maybe even something like 10 or so input variables into a scalar output. And um, the idea here is that we're going to try to minimize or maximize. I think we're trying to minimize that function. And so finding the minimum of a multivariable function means we basically look for the critical points of the multivariable function. I think in the function I'm giving you, there's only one critical point, and it is the minimum, so that's good. But uh, we're going to find that critical point. We're going to find the minimum of our function using this Newton's method formula. And um, so I guess you have to be familiar with how to take the gradient and how to take the Hessian matrix and then how to use this and code it in Python. But the coding in Python works just the same as it did uh, in the last video. So we don't need to actually see another example of that. So with this in mind, let's talk about um, the method of Lagrange multipliers. If we want to find a critical point of a multivariable function 
f, but we also want to respect certain constraints on the input variables. And so those constraints are going to have the form um, g1 is a function of x, y, and z, and it's equal to 0. And then g2 will be a function of x, y, and z, and it'll be equal to 0. Now, if you had more input variables than just three input variables, then you could also have more than two constraints between those input variables. Um, but this is just a, a small problem, right, to get us started. Get started thinking about this. Um, we would define the Lagrange function, and the Lagrange function is a function of x, y, z, lambda 1, and lambda 2. And then this Lagrange function is going to be f of x, y, and z, plus or minus. It doesn't really matter. Um, let me see what the convention is. OK, so the convention is plus. And again, this really doesn't matter, um, but the convention must be to write plus lambda 1 g1 plus lambda 2 g2. And uh, and remember that g1 and g2 are functions of x, y, and z. Um, <clears throat> but then, if we want to find the critical point of this function f under these constraints, then the idea is to just find a critical point of your Lagrange function. So taking the gradient of the Lagrange function, gradient vector would look something like partial L with respect to x, partial L with respect to y, partial L with respect to z, partial L with respect to lambda 1, partial L with respect to lambda 2. So of course, five entries in the gradient vector, since the Lagrange function is now a function of five independent variables. And this is going to be, you know, partial F, partial X, plus partial plus lambda 1 partial g partial x plus lambda 2 partial oh g1 partial x g2 uh, partial x and then the second entry is going to be very similar except with y's instead of x's the third entry will be very similar except with z's instead of x's the fourth entry here is just going to be g1. And then the fifth entry here, the partial derivative of the Lagrange function with respect to lambda 2, that will just be g2. And to find the critical points of my Lagrange function, I have to set this gradient of my Lagrange function equal to the 0 vector. So setting this gradient equal to the 0 vector means that I'm going to have five equations like this equation and this equation and this equation and then also the similar equations that contain y's and z's but are otherwise the same. Um, and so I'll have what the system of equations with five equations, right? And also five unknowns. Unknowns are x, y, z, lambda 1, and lambda 2. And if I have five equations and five unknowns, that's really encouraging, actually. And if these happened to be linear equations, all five of them linear equations, we would call that a system of five linear equations with five unknowns, and then we could solve it using Gaussian elimination.
But if any one of these five equations is nonlinear, meaning if any one of these five equations uh, is not a linear equation, that means we cannot use Gaussian elimination. And what do you use if you can't use Gaussian elimination? We're going to have to use uh, Newton's method for finding the zeros of a multivariable function, multivariable vector valued function. So you can think of this gradient of the Lagrange function as being a multivariable vector valued function because it's a function of five variables and then the value of the gradient is a vector with five entries so this is a multivariable vector valued function or you can just think of the Lagrange function as being a scalar valued multivariable function and if you want to think about the Lagrange function as being a scalar valued multivariable function then you can just use um, you know, Newton's method for finding critical points, you know, where we had the inverse Hessian matrix times the gradient of the Lagrange function. If you wanted to think about this as being a multivariable vector valued function, well then you would just need to take the Jacobian of the gradient of the Lagrange function. But here's the thing, the Jacobian matrix of the gradient of the Lagrange function is the same thing as the Hessian matrix of the Lagrange function. Wow, so it doesn't matter which way you do it, it's actually exactly the same thing. There's different words, different vocabulary that we use to talk about it, but you know, same deal in the end, you would end up writing the same exact Python code. It's going to give you the same answers. There's absolutely nothing different about the computation. Like always, if you have any questions about this or anything else, I'd be happy to answer those questions in class, in office hours, over the email, over Canvas message, etc. Um, so please don't hesitate to reach out for help.